you start the computer. <laughs> Some people asked me last week after I was done, you're not finished, are you? <laughs> Since clearly there were more notes left on the notes from last week, so no, I'm not done. I'm calling this Dealing with the Independent Spirit Part 2. <clears throat> Just uh, hit a few points where we have been. Uh, God tells Moses his name, I am. We've been look, considering what that means and how we have dealt with it in our, our scriptures today. It is normally the Lord in all capital letters is the identifier for us. Its meaning is I'm the self-existent one. I'm the one who causes things to come to pass. I have the power and authority to accomplish my word. That's what that name means. So, again, one of the important things for us when we're reading the scriptures and we run across that name is to stop and ponder what he's saying. Because that's what we need to get within us. That I am or God or Jesus or whatever name we use all ties to the same thing as to who he is and his capabilities and what he can accomplish. That's where our faith ends up resting. We were talking last week that from the time that Moses comes out of the wilderness back to Egypt, from that moment forward, the nation of Israel has to continue to ask themselves, who do I believe God is? They are constantly being challenged. Do I believe God will do what he says he will do? We know, that as we read through the account, they struggled with that a lot. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> In every circumstance they encountered, and folks don't miss this, most if not all, of the circumstances they encountered, God led them into. You understand that the Israelites coming out of Egypt, not being taken on the shortest route. I have that in the notes. God, listen to what God says. Exodus 13, verse 17. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that, that was near for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. Just rough calculations. God could have taken them 200 miles and they would have been in the promised land. But he didn't. Instead, they traveled just on the short part of the route, not counting the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But the route that God took them on, as best we know, is 550 miles. Now, if you offer me 200 or 550, I'm picking the shorter route. But God says, I'm not taking you that way because you're not ready. You're not ready to see war. Some things have to happen first. So he takes them along the Red Sea, and we can go back and read those portions too. But don't miss out. God tells Moses, take them along the Red Sea because Pharaoh's going to come after them. God knows this. And he's telling them, hey, <laughs> tell them, Pharaoh's coming. And all of a sudden they see Pharaoh coming and everybody starts freaking out. Why? Because they hadn't learned yet what they need to learn. That God is these things. And when he says, I'm going to take you out of and bring you into, that God is going to bring them into. It doesn't matter what we encounter on the way. God is going to accomplish his word. The Israelites needed to learn that. So God kept taking them into circumstances where the object of their faith was being tested. He takes them to the long to the Red Sea. Then he takes them to a place where they have no water. Then all of a sudden they encounter a war with the Amalekites. And then he takes them to another place where the water is bitter. 
And each time God is challenging them, are you trusting in the ways of Egypt or will you trust in who I said I am? Every one of those circumstances was for their development, which is exactly what James 1 tells us. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing. Knowing what? That God is using that to train me. That God is using that circumstance to develop further my faith in him. That God is using that circumstance to reveal to me what he knows about my heart. That there are times my heart is still trusting in old things. And God needs me to see that so that I can deal with the faith that I have in the old things and transfer that faith to him. We just sang it. Did you hear it as we sang it? Okay, I'll read it to you. I'll be right back. See, I know this stuff because as we were going through it, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When through the deep waters, I call you to go. Oh, God would never do that. Really? Well, he did it to the Israelites, and James 1 says he'll do it to us too. The rivers of sorrow shall not overflow, for I will be with you, your troubles to bless, and sanctify to you your deepest distress. You say, well, Tim, that's a hymn. That's not the Bible. That is the Bible, folks. When through fiery trials your pathway shall be, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. What's he saying? Trust me. Because I am these things, and I will accomplish my word. The flame shall not hurt you. My only design, your dross to consume and your gold to refine. He says, I take you into situations to consume the old man and refine your faith in me. To make you and form you and transform you into my sons and daughters. God leads them into these situations to prove to them that he is what he says his name is. And that he's faithful to his word. And that no matter what they encounter, God has the plan to give them the victory. Now understand, every time they enter one of these places and they think that, that God just brought them there to die, that's the old man talking. That's the independent spirit. It's the independent spirit that gets frustrated with trials. It's the independent spirit that gets angry with trials. It's the independent spirit that gets angry at God for leading us into those things. Because remember how the independent spirit functions. I don't need God's help. And if I hadn't listened to God, I wouldn't be in this situation. Well, we all know that that's a lie. Because I know from my life, my independent spirit got me into all kinds of circumstances that were not good. God was preparing them, not how to use swords, but how to trust him. Because as it was then, is how it is now, faith in God is our victory. God needed to destroy from within them everything that they had learned in Egypt and to replace it with the truth about who he is. Understand that maturing faith is not just for us as an individual because God has also called us to train sons and daughters. So what we go through isn't just for my refinement 
it's also to improve my teaching of other people. To help direct them in the same faith. This is why living by faith in God has to become a lifestyle. So again, we're very familiar with Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What's he talking about? What am I training the child in? How to trust God. And to recount to those who are under my umbrella of influence, to help them understand, this is what I experienced with God. This is the faithfulness of him. These are the things I've been through, and here's how God moved. You can trust him. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a chapter written to the nation, but specifically also to parents of your responsibility of training your child to have one God. When they crossed the Jordan River, finally, God said, hey, go in there and get 12 stones from the bed of the river and make this pile here. And in time, when you're out wandering around, spending time with your children, and your son says, how come this pile of stones is here? Then tell them. Deut Deuteronomy chapter 6 also says, where God gives them all of these things to participate in, the feasts and the festivals and, and the rules and the regulations and the commandments. And he says, in time, when your son asks you, how come this is how we live? Tell them. Tell them that we were slaves in Egypt. Tell them how God came to deliver us. Tell them how God parted the Red Sea. Tell them how God conquered uh, Pharaoh's and his army. Tell them how God brought water out of a rock. Now there's a good story. Son, let me tell you about who I am is. He brought water from a rock. He didn't lead us to a cave. He didn't lead us to a lake. No, he brought it from a rock to prove to us that when he took us out of in order to bring us into, we could not die in the desert. Because that would mean that God was a failure. But he's not because his name is I Am. And he has the power and authority to accomplish his word. So he was going to bring us into... And here we are today, my son, standing in that land that he promised to bring us into. And our ancestors experienced all kinds of things. Because he was proving to them and proving to us that he is these things. God tells us to make disciples in the same way that God was preparing the people to have their faith in him. Making disciples involves helping people transfer their faith to God and helping them walk through their own trials and keeping their eyes on God while they're going through. From an earthly viewpoint, we like to simply try and fix the problem. Because we see the problem as the problem. Where God is saying the problem isn't the problem. God says, I know all about that. I'm trying to train the heart. So instead of helping them fixate on the problem, help them fixate on him. Because he's the solution. The problem may or may not ever go away in this world. But can I trust him? That's the issue. Because out of my faith in him, the fruit of the spirit flows. The rivers of living water flow. Not simply because the problem went away, but because my trust is in him. Bottom of page one of the notes, Psalm 27, verse three. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his 
faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Verse 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. The psalmist says, it doesn't matter what earthly conditions are. Here's what I've observed with the righteous. They don't withhold. They keep giving. And God keeps supplying. So parents and elders use those terms. Teachers are to set the example. Sons and daughters or students, the young ones in the faith, are exhorted to look to their role models. To learn from them. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Pop, top of page 2 if you're following me there. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. Considering the outcome of their conduct, Jesus Christ did the same yesterday, today, and forever. God was the I am to the Israelites, and he still is. He does not change. He has not failed, nor will he fail, to honor the Genesis 51 promise, or as we know it more so, the Matthew 6.33 promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things he will supply to you. So let's get back to our Matthew account. I'm going to read through the portion where we've been, and then begin to take on this whole issue of the independent spirit once more. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. We've been talking about that now for the past couple of weeks. I'm not going to go through all those pieces again. Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Now, why is Jesus confident to tell them this? Because don't forget, Jesus has a promise from his father. I will not leave your body in Sheol. I will not let it decay, according to the psalmist. You see, Jesus is actually revealing to us where his faith is. He doesn't withhold telling his disciples what's coming. Yes, they're going to kill me. But I have a promise. And my father, oh yeah, he's the I am. You may put me in a grave, I'm not staying there. Because I have a promise. Yes, in the earthly realm, you think nothing can change that. But my father's the I am. He has the power and authority to accomplish his word. He's the one who causes things to come to pass. If my father says, I'm not staying in the grave, I'm not staying in the grave. And he didn't stay in the grave. <laughs> so Jesus tells him, here's what's coming. Verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you're an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of, of men. We talked about this last week, but let me highlight something. One of the first steps in dealing with our own independent spirit are those words. 
When God's trying to tell us something and the independent spirit is telling us something contrary, try those words on it. Hey, independent spirit, get behind me. Because I know your source. It's not from God. And you're not thinking about the plans of God. You're thinking about the things of men. You're an offense to me. Yeah, see, if you start talking to the independent spirit that way, yeah, I know. If you're in the store or in a public place, people might think you're crazy. But we've got to start taking on the independent spirit. I have to start taking on my independent spirit. Because in me, it gets its way too often. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Understand, the first place that God wants to build his church is in your heart and my heart. Not some brick and mortar facility. The church is built in the heart. The, church, the heart is filled with strongholds. The heart has been occupied by an enemy who has led us in unrighteousness and refuses to change. So God says, I'm going to fix that. In the same way that God needed to fix the Israelites before they could enter the land of Canaan, before you and I have a lot of great value for the kingdom, our hearts need fixed. Now, folks, I've been wrestling with this my entire life. So I say this freely. There is a huge difference from knowing what the word of God says and utilizing that word to put my independent spirit to death. We can quote scripture all day long. But until we start utilizing that scripture to put self to death, all we know is scripture. And far too long, the independent spirit continues to reign. The Israelites are just a great example for us as to what's really going on inside all of us. That the Canaanites in the promised land are not the issue. Because God is God. The problem of the Israelites is their own heart. And what they believe about God. Will God do what God has promised to do? And for a majority of them, the answer was no. I don't believe that. The first place of warfare is within us. We need the circumcision of the heart that only God can do. Now again, I understand. I'm standing here, born again at the age of 16. I still feel like I need the circumcision of the heart. And I don't say that to mess anybody up, but listen to what God promises. Here's a promise of God. And if God is God, the one who accomplished his word, here's what God has said. Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now, folks, from my life, part of that is true. But I still deal so much with the old man. So I may not be talking to you, but I'm talking to me. 
Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. I'll bring no famine upon you. And I'll multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you will never need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Verse 33, thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. God gives me a promise that as we destroy the old man, God will rebuild into who I was designed to be. And everything that the enemy has taken from me, God will put back. He wants to change me. And in such a way, verse 36, then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Being transformed isn't just for my sake. It's for the people who also see me. My life becomes a living testimony of the power of God to transform. The independent spirit doesn't yield easily. There's reasons for that. One, it's been in place for so long. Two, there's part of us that looks at the independent spirit and says, well, okay, but sometimes it's, it works. But not all that means is I haven't processed everything the independent spirit has done. Because sometimes I'll look at it and say, okay, that worked for me. But how many relationships did I destroy in the process? Understand, the independent spirit is no different than the seven nations living in the land of Canaan. And what do the scriptures tell us? They drove out some of them. Some of them they did not. Didn't make God happy. And he said, what? They're going to remain so your children can learn war. But God did not intend for them to stay there. Now, I'll give the Israelites kudos for one thing because I think it's a principle. Even though they didn't drive them all out, you will read over and over and over, but they made them servants. My independent spirit may not fully die, but it needs to become the servant of the Holy Spirit. It cannot be allowed to reign and rule and control. I've reached this point because, as I've spoken before, I think one of the detriments to the heaven when you die gospel is that it never gets at the point of putting the independent spirit to death. Everybody wants to embrace heaven in place of hell. But we haven't given them the whole picture that God wants to transform our lives. So I'm convinced that there's a lot of believers, myself for a long period of time, who haven't used the scriptures to defeat my old man. I can quote them. I haven't used them. And have simply found comfort in the fact of the blood of Jesus and his righteousness, I get heaven when I die. And then I keep going, dealing with this independent spirit. So how do we crucify the independent spirit? Well, some of it isn't going to be unfamiliar. <laughs> but again, it's not a matter of quoting the passages, it's a matter of utilizing them. Romans 12, we know very well, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect the will of God. We can quote the passage. But what Paul is saying is the word of God must replace whatever has been in my head to begin with. And I have to do that on a constant basis. It's too easy to simply keep on going, letting the old man reign. We've got to be in pursuit of God's word and then make sure that God's word takes its place. How do we do that? Well, one thing is, every time I'm about ready to do something or make a decision, ask myself, What's the source of the decision I'm making? Because if I haven't asked God, and I'm not listening for his input, I can pretty much guarantee who's driving the decision. Now again, I know I frustrate people with this, and, and we're going to go through it because other people frustrate me in return. So there. We must actively replace whatever is in us with God's truth. His ways have to take over. Ephesians 5, verse 26, in the whole, talking about husbands and wives, God says this, that he, talking about Christ, might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, us, with the washing of water by the word. God intends for his word to cleanse us. John 7, 17, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. The cleansing of our being, the transformation of my inner nature, the transformation of how I think and what controls my thinking has to do with ingesting the word of God and having that word replace whatever has been there. You say, well, how do I know if that's happening? Well, just consider the fruit of the Spirit and consider the loving nature of God. That's a pretty good test for a lot of things because a lot of the things that operate within us are anger, hatred, unforgiveness, frustration. None of those things are from God. So all I have to do, first of all, is start checking my attitude before I even utter a word. What's going on in my head? What's going on in my heart? Is there unrest there? If there's unrest there, that's a good indication that the wrong spirit's in control because God is a God of peace. He's come to bring rest to my inner being. So we have to just stop and start questioning what's happening inside. Does my mind have like 10 possibilities? Because Deuteronomy 6, God says, I the Lord am one. So if my mind is thinking of 10 different possibilities or solutions to what's going on, understand maybe one of those is from God, but all the other ones aren't. And I'm looking for the one. We must not give up seeking the Holy Spirit and silencing the independent spirit. This is probably where I fail the most often. Because I hear the Holy Spirit giving me verses to use in battle all the time. But if it's something I really want to do, I'm very good at telling him, I'm not listening to you right now. And I don't say that 
with, with arrogant. My, my problem is I'm, I, I know that when I do that, I'm being arrogant towards him. And my only hope in all of that is that God says he's a God of mercy. And he's willing to forgive me if I repent. But I understand in my own life, folks, the seriousness of this. And how much I have to go to war. Because for far too long, I've silenced the Holy Spirit and I know I'm doing it. Simply to do what I want to do at the moment. I have to flip that. Because if I'm a son, he's my father. And I have to say what you want, not what I want. But I have to practice that. And the thing is, here's what I know. If I do that, I don't have to repent and confess a whole lot less. And I'll have to deal with conviction a whole lot less. And then the enemy likes to come in with his condemnation, and I'll have to deal with that a whole lot less. Because I know I'm pleasing the Father, because I've done what the Father wants. You understand this is how the enemy just keeps us in constant turmoil. In our reading and in our prayers, we need to claim John 14 and John 16. I'm going to read through them here. They're on page four of the notes. Years ago, God took me to this, and when I study the word, I use this a lot. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I'll come to you. Again, I can quote that and quote that and quote that. But you know what hit me last night? God said, did you see the word orphan? The word orphan, without father or mother, without someone to lead, without someone to guide, without someone to counsel. Jesus says, I won't leave you as an orphan. Understand who I am. I'm the one who needs someone to lead me. And I know from my own life, I need him to lead me. Because if he doesn't, I'm walking the wrong path. Jesus says, he doesn't say, I'll leave you as father. He doesn't say, I'll leave you as mother. He says, no, I won't leave you as an orphan. Do you understand? Just in that language alone, he's telling us, I will never leave you up to your independent spirit. Because that's not how you were designed. I will always give you leading. I will always speak to you about your footsteps. I will always counsel you on how to handle the circumstance you're facing. I will always give you input in the decision that you need to make. Always. Because he has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. But to be with me always. And to Joshua he promised that there would be victory as long as Joshua meditated upon his word all the time. John 16 verse 12. I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore he said, 
I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. I'm not going to read through the whole section again, but in Luke 15, in Luke's account of Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray, Jesus goes through the Lord's Prayer, and then he adds some things to that to help them understand how to pray. And he tells them a story about a man who has friends coming, and they arrive at his house, but he has no food, so he goes to his neighbor's house to ask them for supply. And it's already past bedtime. But he keeps knocking at the door and asking, and finally the man gives him what he needs. And Jesus continues on and says, keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. For if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, he'll answer. If you knock, he'll open. And if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who seek him? One of the things that breaks my heart is how many people I encounter that do not believe the Spirit will speak to us. It crushes me. Because if we don't believe the Spirit will speak, then there's only one Spirit we listen to. And it's not God's. Jesus has made it clear. Again, just think of the, think of the imagery. Jesus had not only the twelve, but he had a lot of other disciples who followed him. They had intimate access to Jesus anytime they wanted. And they could ask him anything they wanted to ask him. And he would tell them. And Jesus says to us, it's beneficial if I go away so that the Spirit can come. I won't leave you as orphans. God wants to speak to us. He wants to direct us because he knows the independent spirit is not the right thing. Imagine the heart pain of God when Adam and Eve believed the lie and ate of the tree that said, God, I don't need you anymore. Read through the prophets when the nation said, we don't need you anymore. Think of our own relationships with people when some will look at us and say, I don't need you anymore. It is wrong. It is ungodly and untrue. to believe the Holy Spirit doesn't talk. It's just not true. Hebrews 11:6 Without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder or response of those who diligently seek him. Here's another one just for proof. John 10, verse 3. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, independent spirit, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I put it in the notes. We've talked about this before. It's very interesting in the Hebrew language. The word word, the word shepherd, the word wilderness, the word pasture, 
speaking and sheepfold all come from the same root word. And the reason that's true is, is that shepherds lead their flocks by walking in front of them and talking and singing. And the sheep just go where they hear. God wants to talk to us. He intends to talk to us. Our part of the covenant is to love, to believe, to exercise faith in God. We display that by seeking him. And once we've received, then by obeying what he says to us. I put a note in the notes that also came to my thinking as I was working on this last week. That my relationship with God just isn't one of, Dad, what are you telling me to do? But it should come out of a attitude of gratefulness that he came and saved me. And I think there's part of that plays into this whole defeating of the independent spirit. When I realize that the independent spirit only gets me into trouble. When the independent spirit only causes pain. Then to know that God came to deliver me from that. Is part of the way in which I defeat the independent spirit. I mean, it's the same thing, you know. We know this probably better from a parental standpoint when we see our kids playing with people that get them into trouble all the time. It's like, you need to stop hanging out with them. Well, we have to do the same thing with the independent spirit. All you do is get me into trouble. All you do is cause pain. Get behind me. Let's understand some things about the independent spirit. Talking about the fact that it doesn't like to go away easily. Page five of the notes, middle of the way down. There's some things that go on in the Old Testament in the Exodus. In Numbers chapter 12, Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, get offended at the fact that Moses is the one who's leading all the time. And they go to him and says, hey, come on, man. God talks to us too. And God deals with that. In Numbers 13, 10 of the spies lack faith in God. And in Numbers 14, they want to stone the two voices for God. Yeah, see, the independent spirit knows how to fight. It knows how to come to our lives and say, well, I know as much as the Holy Spirit knows. I can direct you in the right way. And the independent spirit wants to stone the voice of God. In number 16, Korah and others lead a rebellion against Moses' leadership. They are portrayals for us of how the independent spirit works in our lives. Trying to convince us that it knows just as much or even better than the Holy Spirit knows. Which is why we need to deal with it as God dealt with these people. Ground swallows up or opens up and swallows them up. That shuts that voice up. God gives Miriam leprosy, which means she has to stay outside the camp. Well, it's hard to hear what she's saying when she's outside the camp. God dealt with these things in a harsh manner for us to understand. Don't listen to that voice. It does not think of the things of God. We have to start treating the independent spirit the same way. I'm sorry. I have to start treating the independent spirit the same way. So what do we learn? If we follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, 
God in his power and authority will make the independent spirit a servant. But we have to be active in this. God does lots of things supernaturally. But the choice of what voice I'm going to follow is always mine to make. I have to make it. In talking to the church, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, bottom of page 5 of the notes. Verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Nor do they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified now Paul's not done again we put a break in it we go to chapter 10 but this is still part of Paul's conversation moreover brethren I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea all were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea all ate the same spiritual food all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ but with most of them, God was not well pleased. Verse 6, now these things became our examples. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, let him who thinks he doesn't need the voice of the Spirit take heed because he's going to listen to the independent spirit. No temptation has overtaken you except as such common to man. Now, again, what we tend to do with this is we talk about kind of outside things. But again, the outside things are easily dealt with if we get the internal thing correct. So let's talk about the internal. No temptation. What's the temptation? The independent spirit trying to tell me something. That's the temptation. No temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. And in the midst of that temptation, God has made a way out. What's the way out? What he tells me to do. Again, stop thinking about all the behavior stuff and start with where it all begins. Because the behavior is an extension of a decision I've made as to whose voice I'm going to listen to. And the temptation that I need to deal with is the temptation of the independent spirit trying to direct my life. And while it may seem as a stronghold in my life, God says, but I have the power to conquer it. I'm the way out. Get my input. So, folks, when we're fighting that battle, you know one of the things we first do? Don't do anything. But fall on our knees and ask God, what is your word? One of the ways to deal with the independent spirit is not to do what he says. It's better to do nothing in that sense than to do what he tells me to do. God won't chastise me for doing nothing. I will have to answer for God for doing what the independent spirit has told me to do. So in the process, then I go after, God, what are you saying? You told me you would give me the way out. What's the way out? What's the word from your word that I can use in this moment to slay what the independent spirit is saying to me? God will speak. Somebody posted this quote the other week. I thought it was really good. 
Leonard Ravenhill, who was an English evangelist. Everyone wants to be clothed with power, but no one wants to be stripped of self. Again, one of the reasons that we struggle within the church of not seeing God move is because we're too often listening to the independent spirit. And God is not going to validate the independent spirit. That would be really stupid. Everybody okay? Let me just touch on this part and then we'll pick up on it next week. In that whole discussion of dying to self, putting ourselves on the cross that Jesus is talking about, Matthew 16, verse 27 says this, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. We have to do some things to tie all the pieces together, but understand, folks, that the works he's talking about are the product of which spirit we listen to. The rest of Matthew proves the case. We'll get to that. But don't fixate just on, quote, the works. Understand the connection to, of that verse to everything that's come before it that we will have to answer to God for the things we did based upon which spirit we have listened to. That's what's really happening here. Everybody okay? Ready to go to war? You stand with me this morning. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you just haven't come and dropped your word and then left but you watch over it you move and you orchestrate to help us understand it and to get it rooted within ourselves Lord help us I pray to take up the word apply it to ourselves and learn and practice that Lord so that we can be transformed and then be in a position to honestly be able to help others develop that relationship too. We thank you and praise you for your grace, for your patience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.